you chose to worship with us at Lighthouse this morning. If you're visiting, we want to welcome you. And uh, we are just down home folks. We like biscuits and gravy, pinto beans and cornbread. And we are the, uh, we just like down home stuff. So if you're visiting with us this morning, make yourself welcome. And uh, we want to welcome you. Uh, man, isn't it nice to see the sun shining this morning? Man, no rain, no snow. Man, it's good. So that means he keeps me singing in my heart. So let's stand and sing. He keeps me singing. There's this in my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not I with thee, peace be still. In all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know Fills my every longing Keeps me singing as I go All my life was wrecked by sin and strife Discord filled my heart with pain Jesus swept across the broken strings Stirred the slumbery chords again Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown, I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, the things you've done for us this week. Father, we just thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, we thank you most of all for sending your Son that we might have eternal life. Father, we ask now that you uh, bless our service this morning, that the songs will be sung, that it will be pleasing to you. Bless Pastor Kevin as he brings the message on the church at Thyatira, that we might, uh, Father, just absorb what you have to say to us this morning, and we might... Uh, do what you would have us to do. Now, Lord, bless and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I forgot. Well, I forgot the order of the service. Mine's the first to go. What have I got, Chuck? Oh, he touched me. <laughs> he touched us, didn't he? He touched us and made us whole. Let's think he touched me. <laughs> yeah. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath the load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me. Touch 
touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me. I was telling people this morning that uh, whoever said the, we are in the golden years when you get older than 50, the golden years have turned into copper and bronze. <laughs> it's not golden anymore, and it's just, not, it's just not as good. This is a song that we have not sung for a great, great while, but it, I want you to watch the words of this song. And, you know, Jesus is a cornerstone. He's the cornerstone of our life. He's our foundation. He's what we live on. Jesus is the cornerstone. Say 
sing a, a new chorus um, that you may have heard, you may have not. Um, uh, but when we walk through those doors in the back, we come through these doors, we're in the presence of Jehovah. And this is a great chorus, in the presence of Jehovah. In the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Peace, Troubles Man. surgeries, other problems, financial problems, but this is a place that we can take. This is a place where we just lay it all out. In the presence of Jehovah, he's here, right here in the midst. In the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Peace, troubles Children, you are dismissed. Everybody else stay standing, he said. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Children, you are dismissed. Older kids out back with them. The rest of the youngins go out back that way. All right, Revelation chapter 2. We're going to read from verses 18 through 29. Give them a moment to get out. They make a lot of noise. It's good to have that. Uh, <clears throat> look, we're going to read from uh, verse 18 through 29. This is the longest letter to any church that Jesus has given. Um, so there's a lot to be said, so we'll be here for about three or four hours. No, I'm just kidding. Um, kind of. Um, I'm going to read the even this time. You read the odd off of the screen, or the New King James Version. And um, then we will uh, get to verse 29, and we'll all say it together. So verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes 
like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children to death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the mind and heart, and I will get according to your words. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Lord God, you are an amazing God, and you are awesome. And Father, we come today just to realize that you are almighty. You have all power. And Father God, I thank you for that. And I thank you for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came, who died, for our sin, who, who was buried and rose again and then ascended to sit at the right hand of God Almighty. Thank you, Father, for who you are. I pray today that you would open our hearts to your word. And, Father, I pray today that you would open uh, just our minds to truth. And, Father, that we would look inside our own self and that we would examine ourselves so that we don't have to be facing the judgment of God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy and your grace that extends to each and every person. And Lord, through all things, we give you the praise because you alone are worthy. And all God's people said, all right, you can be seated. Just a couple of things before we get started or as we get started. Just a reminder what Dr. Heinzen said about prophecy he said, God has not given us prophecy in his word to scare us, but to prepare us. And I'm hoping, um, even as we just sang, that Jesus could come at any moment, that you are prepared to meet Jesus. Amen? Amen. Uh, then the outline that we've looked at, uh, we looked at the opening, the first eight verses, and then we're, we're in the middle of looking, or at the beginning, actually looking at John's vision of the Lord's Day, what's going on, and then at the end, we'll see uh, the closing of the letter, the last few verses there. The church at Thyatira is representative of the Dark Ages. Um, from approximately 590 A.D. to about 1000 A.D., or a little bit more than that, um, but it was, a, it was, as it says, it was a dark period in man's history, and it was a dark period in man's religion. Um, and so when you, uh, if you look at the map, when you leave uh, Pergamum, the, the, the top uh, city up there, which we looked at last week, we looked at Ephesus, and uh, we saw that their number one problem was what? Do you remember? They had done something. What had they done? Left their first love, right? And then Smyrna, what was wrong with Smyrna? Nothing, right? So he was just commending them and telling them to keep on keeping on. And then Pergamum, what was Pergamum's problem? Culture was beginning to come into the church, and they were beginning to follow uh, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They were following after the ways of uh, Balaam. Um, and so we're going to move inland now and see the rest of these churches. Um, and so you see Thyatira sitting there. Uh, it was situated in a very beautiful uh, valley, a very beautiful location. It was built by a man by the name of Lysicomus. Lysicomus? 
Yeah, that guy. But it was rebuilt by a guy by the name of Seleucus I. He was the founder of the Seleucid dynasty. Have you ever heard of Alexander the Great? Okay. Alexander the Great died and had this great kingdom. And when he died, his kingdom was split into four different dynasties. Seleucid was one of those guys. Um, it, it, his, uh, the, his reign extended from the Hermas Valley to the Himalayas. And finally, this area would fall to the Romans. No city in that area was as completely destroyed as Thyatira was. So for this reason, it's very disappointing to try and find ruins to show you. There's not a lot. There's not a lot there today. Um, in fact, they, they cover about uh, one block of the city that's there today. Um, it's the modern day city of Akhizer, Turkey. Akhizer means white castle. And it's about 50 miles inland from the Aegean Sea. They, the city became um, prosperous under um, Vespasian, who was the Roman emperor. It was the headquarters of many ancient, what they called guilds. Guilds were uh, over potters or over tanners or weavers or robe, robe makers or dyers. Guilds. Uh, Thyatira was the center of the dyeing industry. Uh, that's where, this is where uh, labor unions must have started, okay? Um, it was the center of the dyeing uh, industry. Uh, Lydia, who you read about in Acts chapter 16, uh, known as the seller of purple, purple, who in Philippi became Paul's first convert. We'll talk about her more here, but she lived in this city. Um, the dye was taken from a plant that grows in that area. It was known as Turkey Red today. Um, the main god that they worshipped was Apollo. Does anyone know what Apollo was known for? Boxing. He fought Rocky, and he just passed away. That's exactly correct. He was the sun god, S-U-N, okay? So that's important, because when we read again, when we get back into Scripture, we're going to see why uh, Jesus describes himself as he does. He was also the son of Zeus. Apollo was the son of Zeus. Zeus was known to be the the mighty God above all the other gods and goddesses. He was the father of them. And he was the, he was the, son, uh, uh, he was the son of Zeus. And this was the one God that everybody in that culture, in that city, worshipped, Apollo. Um, Thyatira was located in a long pass. It was a city that was built for defense. It was known as a shield city. It was designed to protect or to shield the other royal cities, the three that we looked at before, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. It was designed to protect them from invading armies. Um, it stood in the middle of a valley on a very slight rising uh, ground. Its strength lay in the, in, in the fact that Rome stationed its strongest warriors, strongest army part, part of the army, the elite guard in this area. So if you will, this is where the Green Beret or the Navy SEALs were stationed. Okay? Um, as a shield city, it was kind of thought of as a disposable city. And so as a result, nothing of any great importance was built there. In Ephesus, you had this great, great temple made to Diana. Um, in Pergamum, you had this great temple made to Zeus. In, in Thyatira, there was nothing great or spectacular that was made. It was kind of like our modern-day city of... I was going to say Cleveland, but sure, you go there. I don't care. Um, there's not really anything important in this city. Thyatira was probably the least of these seven cities 
where the churches of Asia were located. It was not built on top of a mountain. It was built in a valley. And yet, this is the longest letter written here. And Lee, you're going to have to turn that fan off for me so I can keep my Bible in its right place. I'll stop your whining. But listen, this is an interesting word. It's an interesting letter given to us. It's a word that is detected, detested, and determined about this church. So let's look at, first of all, what the Lord detected about this letter. What did Jesus say about this letter? And as we do in, all, in every one of these churches, he begins by giving a description of himself. And so we know this is Jesus because why? It's written in red. Thank you. But he's also going to describe himself. Listen to what he says. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So first of all, notice what Jesus calls himself. He is what? The what? And notice what it says first and foremost. The Son of God. Of God. There's a university that has claimed ownership of that word the, and then they put their name after it. The problem is they're not the they're not the back to back to back Big Ten champions and national champions like the Michigan Wolverines. Just saying. Jesus says he is the Son of God. Why? Because the Thyatirans worshipped Apollo, who was the Sun God. And so Jesus came along and says your son God is nobody. I am son of almighty God. I am son of, and not just a son, I am the son of almighty God. He is claiming his rightful place. He says, stop worshiping that false God. Look at me. I am the son of God. He then gives us a picture of the Son of God. He says, His eyes are like a flame of fire, and His feet like fine brass. His eyes, flame of fire, searching out each individual as He walks amongst the, amongst the church. And His feet like burnished brass. And brass rep represents judgment. So this is a picture of Jesus, not just as the Son of God, but he's the judge. I remember years ago, I think it was Flip Wilson, or, or, or Soupy Sales, or whoever, whoever it was a flip. here comes the judge. Listen, folks, Jesus is the judge. He is the, the judge. He is in fine, his feet are like fine brass. Um, historians have found evidence that Thyatira was a place where brass was smelted. And so there was a lot of bronze work done in this area. And bronze was associated with military. And so the Roman elite guard was here where they smelted and made weapons and things made out of brass. And so Jesus is using this symbolism to talk about judgment. His eyes, his feet portray the penetrating insight in the judgment of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is saying, I'm judging you. That's a scary thought. I'm judging you. I'm judging this church. However, notice, he has a word of commendation for this church. If you think that the Roman church during the Dark Ages was all about uh, awful, evil things, uh, you need to check up on the history. Jesus says this in verse 19, I know your works. I know your love. I know your service, your faith. And your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. He says six things that he emphasizes here and he commends them for. First of all, he says, I know your works. 
I know your deeds. He says, listen, I know what you've been up to. Sometimes we think God is unaware of us down here. He's not sure of what's going on in our world today. Jesus is assuring us here, he does know. He knows everything, and he's been taking note of what's going on. He says, I know your works. He says, I know your love. I know that you truly love one another. I know that your church is crazy and that whoever walks in this church is going to get a hug. Or two or three. Yes, Judy, you're right. I know you love one another. I know you care about one another. I know you pray for one another. I know you cry with one another, especially some of you. You are obeying John 13, by, which says, By this will all men know you are my disciples if you love one another, even as I have loved you. Hey, Thyatira, Lighthouse Baptist, you are a loving bunch. The church at Ephesus lost their first love. Church of Thyatira loved each other. Not just in word. They were ministering to each other. They were helping each other that were hurting. They were taking food to them and helping the sick and the poor. They were demonstrating in tangible ways the love of Jesus Christ. Notice the third thing he says. I know about your faith. I know about the fact that you are faithful. That means not to give in. I know you're not compromising. I know you're not giving up. When things get tough, you stand true. And yeah, it was tough being a Christian in Thyatira. And it's getting tougher to be a Christian in America. It was tough because in those days, if you didn't have a statue to worship, then you were considered to be a weirdo. Your God can't even be seen. How are you going to worship him? Their faithfulness was evidence in the way they stood firm in the faith in Jesus Christ. But not only that, but notice the next word. Your service... Uh, I, I put them in reverse order here. You excelled in service. The Greek word for service there is the word, word diakonis. It's where we get our word deacon. It literally means you are a household servant. He's telling them this, you're busy. You're busy at church. You're busy in the community. You're not just coming to church to warm a seat. You were out there demonstrating not just to one another in the form of loving each other, but you were out there in the world helping each other, helping your lost neighbors, taking care of others. You're meeting your needs. You're doing the things that demonstrate Jesus was really your Lord. But then notice the next word. He says, your patience. And some of your Bibles say you perseverance. It literally means you are enduring under pressure. You have pressure on you, but you're still enduring. I don't know about you, but since 2020, I think the pressure has tightened up and, 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 and cranked up a ton. And he says this, you're holding fast in the culture. You're holding fast in the society that is hostile to Christianity. And then he tells them, that their latter works are greater than the first. He says, listen, there's a growth process. There is a growth, proce a growth process. In every Christian's life, there ought to be a growth process in your life. If you're not closer to Jesus this year than you were last year, and if you're further away, then you have problems. Jesus didn't move, you did. And whether you know it or not, you need to be growing. I don't know if you know this or not. You'll find this out. Children grow up fast. 
Yeah? Children grow up fat. You know, my oldest son, when he was born, I still remember that day. When my, my wife went into labor early in the morning, and I called the doctor, and he said, get to the hospital. They told me, get her to the hospital, which was 35 miles away, 35 minutes away. And she said, I got to take a shower and get dressed and get ready first. <laughs> and her mother and I were like, come on. You think that baby's going to wait on you to put your makeup on? Let's go. He, that baby doesn't care. And we get there, and she has to go in the emergency C-section. It's like, yeah, it's a good thing you didn't wait and do a, cook dinner first. <laughs> do you know he was born March 9th, 1990? He's 34 years old. In March 9th, he will be 34 years old. And we can't figure out how that happened because we, we, we knew each other in kindergarten, got married in kindergarten. We're only 39 Oh, is that what it is? That's not true, by the way. We didn't meet each other until college. How do these things happen? You know what? You can't stop it. And you shouldn't be trying to stop your growth process in your Christian life either. You should be wanting to grow in your Christian life and come closer to Christ. Jesus is telling them in their growth process that their deeds now are better than they were when they started. And he's commending them for this. They're growing in their faith. And you'd think that if, they, that if you stood before Jesus and he told you these six things, that you'd be like, huh, look at me. I'm awesome for Jesus. I'm serving him. I'm loving people. I'm being faithful. I'm, I, 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 you know what I'm doing, Jesus. <clears throat> I'm even persevering when people are harsh and mean to me. But then he says this in verse 20, nevertheless, or but, or however, I have something against you. And all of a sudden, and you're in Thyatira, and he tells you those great things that you're doing, and he says, nevertheless, I have something against you. You go, uh-oh. What's he know? What's he seen? What do I need to change? What's going on in my life? What did the Lord detest about this church? Look at, first of all, the source of the heresy. I have a few things against you. You allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idol. Despite these wonderful things, there's a problem. And it centers around a woman named in the Old Test from the Old Testament whose name was Jezebel. Have you met anybody named Jezebel in your life? Have you met anybody named Judas in your life? Have you met anybody named Benedict Arnold in your life? These are names we just do not name our children. Because they're names of traitors. We come to understand or associate with someone who is from a biblical point of view as, as, Je, as Jezebel as a, someone who is wicked and ma manipulative. Someone who is seducing and evil. It comes from the book of 1 Kings. It comes from the idea that Jezebel, who was the daughter of a man but who was the king of Sidon, who was also a prophet of Baal. Baal was a false god, and he uh, became, uh, he, the king of Sidon uh, then would marry uh, Jezebel, his daughter, to Ahab, the king of the northern tribes of Israel. So you remember, uh, after Solomon had died, the tribes of Israel are split into basically two countries. You have two tribes in the, no in the south. Um, and then you have ten tribes in the north. And all of the kings in the north are evil. Um, they don't follow God. And so these ten tribes, uh, the, the two in the south, Judah, uh, are, so there are some good ones. But the ten in the, in, the no, in the north are evil. Now, King Ahab 
was one of the worst kings in, in uh, the history of Israel. He was evil. Um, instead of trusting God to protect and to provide his kingdom, he buys into the same kind of politics of the other pagan nations around him. So he marries Jezebel, the daughter of the king of Sidon, so that he can have a military, political, and economic alliance with Sidon. But when he married Jezebel, he got more than he bargained for. The scripture says that she was a worshiper of Baal. It also tells us that she hated the God of Israel. So she hated anybody associated with the God of Israel. And that included the prophets. And so she tried to get rid of the prophets. She tried to have them killed. She was a better pagan than Ahab was a Jew. She was determined to destroy all of the prophets of God. So along comes 1 Kings 18. And Elijah, the prophet of God, has had enough with these people, and so he takes them up onto the Mount Carmel. And they have a competition. And they take an altar, and they build an altar, and they say, now you put your sacrifice up there, and you call on your gods, the prophet of Baal, you call on your gods, and we'll have a contest to see whose God can burn up that sacrifice. Y'all with me? Y'all know this story, right? All right, so I'll make it short so it'll help you out. But if you don't know the story, go and read 1 Kings 18. It's a great story. And so they, for half a day, start calling on Baal to come and light this thing on fire. And he doesn't do it. And so Elijah being Elijah, I think he was, I think he was from the north. Uh, he was definitely from the north. And so he's a little bit sarcastic. And he says, hey, why, why don't you yell a little louder? Maybe he's eating. Maybe he's out to lunch. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's like, like my grandkids were when they called and they wanted to wake me up. Baba! And maybe he just got to yell a little bit louder to get, and he's making fun of them. And guess what? They don't do it. And the Bible tells us that they become so incensed that they begin to cut themselves, and some of them die trying to get Baal to come and do this. Elijah says, okay, my turn. And they build a trench around the altar. And he builds the altar up. He builds a trench around the altar. He puts a sacrifice on it. And he says, fill it up with water. Pour it out all over the, the altar and the sacrifice. Pour it all over it. Put water around. Do it again. Do it again. Three times. Fills it up. Water in the trench. You got to remember, it hasn't rained for three years. And they fill this baby up. And Elijah turns and he says, Oh God, show him your God. And fire come down from heaven. And it burns up the, the sacrifice and the altar. And the Bible says it licked up the water. Oh, victory! Then you know what he did? Elijah, he took off running. He took off running. And he wasn't afraid of the rain that was coming. He was afraid of the woman that was on the throne. Because she said she was going to kill him. Listen, God is greater than anybody. He greater and has more power than him. He should have trusted him, but he didn't. Look, Jesus uses this word here to talk about that he's wicked and she's evil. And, and she's doing all these things. So when Jesus uses the word... Here, uh, to describe the woman at the church, it's pregnant with, with meaning. It's not lost on them that he's not talking about somebody who's friendly to the faith. He says, this woman calls herself a prophetess, but she's evil. She's teaching you bad and evil and wicked things. And she's leading his prophets astray. Look at the seriousness of this. He says, she's... She calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. 
In Thyatira, they were controlled mainly by the trade guilds, as I mentioned before. The trade guilds were the center of social life. Um, each, each one was important. They were important for your social gatherings. They were important for who you worshipped. If you were a potter, they had a god for your, uh, your group. If you were a weaver, they had a god for your group. Now, Apollo was over the entire town, but each guild, each idea, each trade has its own god or goddess that they worshipped as well. And so they called these their patron gods. Um, it's where the Roman Catholics got their idea of patron saints. And so this city was divided up into all these guilds. Um, these guilds were then the law. You followed those guilds. If you broke the law, those guilds got you. They didn't have uh, police officers in that time. They had guilds who would take care of you and what you were doing. Um, that made, uh, in each part of the city, the guild where you lived told you which god to worship. That was a problem for Christians. In Acts, we learn about a lady by the name of Lydia. We learn that Lydia was a seller of purple. That purple came from a sea snail. It was a lucrative business. One day, Lydia went to Philippi to buy and sell cloth. And while the, she was there, she met this little crazy man named Paul, who talked about not the Son of God, but the Son of God, whose name was Jesus, who was crucified for her sins, and then was buried, and on the third day he rose again. She learned from Paul that this Jesus, the Son of God, loved her and wanted to know her. He wanted to have a relationship with her. He wanted to forgive her of her sin and transform her life. So Lydia believed in Jesus and received him as her Savior, and then she went back to Thyatira, where she was well known, where she was respected, because she had always lived in that society, in that guild of sellers of purple. But now she doesn't believe in the patron God. She doesn't believe in Apollo. She believes in the Son of God. She is a new creation. And God says, come out of that paganism. I want you to live differently. But to do that cost her her business. To do that cost her her economic standing. To do that, she lost her livelihood and eventually her reputation. When you follow Jesus, there is a cost to be paid. If you, you might want to raise this down. If you go along to get along, then you compromise your relationship with God. If you go along to get along, then you compromise your relationship with God. And too many believers are doing that today. So this is what would ha happen. She would then go to church with her new believer friends that are there in Thyatira. And she started sharing about how hard it is. And she would find others that were in the same church that were talking about how hard it is to live in this society. And then a woman would stand up and say, I've got a word from God. He knows how tough it is for you Christians to live in a pagan culture. And he just wants you to know that it's okay if you do all those things as long as you don't mean it in your heart. How many of you know that if you get a new word from God and it doesn't match the word of God, that you are out of line? You are in sin. And it is not from God Almighty. It is from the God of this world, the Satan. Listen, this teaching, and this is what the Gnostics were teaching. The Gnosticism was one of the first real threats to Christianity. The Gnostics taught that everything spiritual was good. Everything material was bad. So they denied that Jesus came in the flesh because all flesh is evil. So the person who died on the cross was not Jesus Christ, but was the man that was born. That the Jesus spirit just came into his life at the baptism and left before he died on the cross. Therefore, God didn't pay for your sin. I don't believe that. 
But that's what it taught. But because, you're, because your flesh is evil, or, or your, yeah, your flesh is evil and your spirit is good, you can go out and do whatever you want. And if you came to this knowledge, then you're superior than everybody else. That's garbage. So they were listening to Jezebel teaching this garbage in the church. And guess what? Jesus was not happy. Jesus is not happy if you don't teach his word. Look at the stubbornness of the heresy, verse 21. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. What was she doing? She was causing division in the church. They were afraid, people were afraid of her because of her influence. They were afraid that if they got out on the, right, on the wrong side of her, they wouldn't get to go to the social events. Jesus said, I've given them time to repent. He says, you know what? I've tolerated her long enough. That word time, or in some of your Bibles, it's space, or tolerate. It means you've let it be. You've let this sin be amongst you. You're not confronting it. You're afraid of it. You have permitted it for all, for all their love, which was commendable, for all your service, for all your faithfulness, for all your patience. In spite of the fact that you're growing, you're being passive when it comes to resisting sin. There's two sides to our faith. One is knowing the truth and walking and living in it. The other side is confronting evil when we see it. It's calling sin, sin. We don't have a problem with loving one another. Amen? We have a problem with calling sin, sin. We have a problem with calling heresy, heresy. They may say, I believe Jesus died on the cross for sin. I don't have a problem with that. If they say, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin, I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is if they say, I believe he died only for certain people. I have a problem with that. And you know who else had a problem with that? Jesus and John and the Holy Spirit. And that's false teaching. That's heresy. Jesus died for everybody. The church at Ephesus had lost their first love. The church at Thyatira loved everyone, but they refused to call sin sin because after all shouldn't we just tolerate one another can't we all just get along Jesus said listen I've called this woman to repent look at the suppression of the heresy verse 22 and 23 it's no wonder Jesus was outraged and threatened them with judgment. Verse 22. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. She has no desire to repent of her immorality. And it's one thing to be offered the grace of God and accept it by repenting and turning from our sin. It's another to, re- to uh, be offered the grace of God and choose out of our own free will to reject it. What is clear in this passage is God gives us a choice. Just like he gave them a choice last week when we looked at the church at at, um, Pergamos. He gave them a choice. He gave them a choice to repent. But Jesus has a limit to his sin. To, To sin. Not his sin. To sin. To our sin. Jesus has a limit to when he will act upon our sin. He allows judgment to come. And I'm just going to tell you this morning that the United States of America, as well as the church in America, is pushing the limits. So he says, okay, you refuse to repent. I'm going to cast her into a sickbed. Because why? Why? There are consequences to sin. Every decision from our free will that we make has a consequence. The first was the consequence of judgment and would come on Jezebel. He would cast her into a sick bed. 
and not her alone, but those who commit adultery with her. What would he do for them? Well, he would cast them into great tribulation. He's going to tell you, I am going to show you that I am the Son of God. I am going to show you that I am all-powerful. I am going to show you that I have more power than Congress. I am going to show you that I have more power than the White House. I am going to show you that I have more power than the city, uh, city leaders. I am going to show you that I am God. And some of you I'm going to cast and going to have consequences. You are going to be cast into a time of great persecution. Doesn't that sound wonderful? I'm going to cause you to have all sorts of tribulation and difficulty. Those are some really harsh words. But Jesus goes on, look at verse 23. Not only will I cast her into her sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, but verse 23, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Listen, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven of our sin, but we are not perfect. God calls us to regularly examine ourselves. We are so good at examining our brothers and sisters. Jesus said, you need to examine yourself. You need to consider the plank in your own eye before you consider the little sliver in that other person's eye. Examine yourselves. Are you walking in sin or are you walking with Jesus? And if you examine yourself and you say, yeah, I'm walking in sin, guess what? There are consequences. We won't lose our salvation. You didn't save yourself. You can't unsave yourself, but there is a sin unto death. Don't reject Jesus come to him verse 24 through 29 is not only what the Lord detected what the Lord detested but it's directed to those who are not involved with Jezebel it says what the Lord determined the first thing we see is the overseer and his fellows in verse 24 he says now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira as many as do not have this doctrine who are not listening to this woman who have not known the depths of Satan as they say I will put on you no other burden but hold fast what you have till I come to those who refuse to follow the teachings of Jezebel or get involved in her sin, Jesus says, I don't have any other burden for you. All I'm going to tell you is that you just need to hold fast. Hold fast to what? To what you know. Don't let go. Don't stop doing the good things. Don't compromise. Don't give in. Hold fast. Hold firm. Notice he says in verse 24, the depths of Satan. That's really an interesting statement. What is he referring to here? Well, there was a cult in those days affiliated with the Gnostics called uh, the Ophites. And they... Worship snakes. So this was the original snake handling church. And they made a parody of Paul's words. You know that all, all heresy boasts of superior spiritual knowledge and perception. That is what this group is doing. The heresy today is no different. They tell us, well, you just don't understand. Or we've gained a higher knowledge. And as I said before, if that higher knowledge is, goes against what God says, my, my two-year-old granddaughter, she just turned two. She's, she's so cute. 
She's the sweetest little thing. That's because she loves me. She sees me and she goes, ah! She has a theological term that she's learned for heresy. (laughs) That's exactly what that teaching is. God has given you a greater word than his word. You are listening to the God of this world and not the God of the universe. Here's the overcomer. Uh, The overcomer in his future, verse 26 through 29. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star, and he has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To those who overcome, to those who hold fast, to those who, who overcome this terrible teaching and this terrible person, you'll rule the nations with me. But I love verse 28. I will give him the morning star. You know who that is? Somebody said it. Who said that? Jesus. What is he saying? I will give you myself. I will give you myself, the bright and morning star. What a wonderful promise that he will give us. Can I tell you what happened to this church? not long after they received this message, this church, as well as the town of Thyatira, was completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. It had a very brief existence because they chose not to repent, but chose to follow in the path of a Jezebel. I'll give you four things this morning real fast, or maybe not too fast. Four things, four, four things to help you apply this, okay? First of all, there's a word here about division. There's a word here about division. We live in a world that does not speak truth. I say that because they tell you that the greatest thing is to be unified, the greatest thing is for all, just to, all of us just to get along and be one. You know that Satan wants that. He wants one world government. He wants one world po- uh, politi- policy, one, one world um, financial be- dollars or whatever they're going to use. He wants that. He wants all of us just to get up and have a big holy hug and hold hands and sing a praise song and be happy. Do you know God is really good at math? And he divides things. He divided the night from the day, the sea from the land. Someday he's going to divide the wheat from the tares, the goat from the sheep. Our God came to bring division between what is right and what is wrong. Not all division is bad. We are called to walk in light as he is light and not walk in darkness and unity is not to be achieved at any price that's that's unity is not biblical Ephesians 5 tells us that we are to walk in love it also says that we are not to participate in the deeds of darkness but rather we are to hold on to to expose them we're to call sin sin we're to call it out scripture gives us clear unmistakable ways by which we are to confront both bad doctrine and bad deeds within the church. As I told you last Sunday, don't put me on a pedestal because I'm just like you. I'm a sinner. And so are Fred and RJ and and Lisa. And who said that's right? Judy, she's a sinner too. Who else wants to say that's right? Because it's right. We are all sinners. And we are only saved by grace. Listen. Jesus Christ died for this church. 
None of us did. Jesus did. He redeemed it. You belong to him. Your allegiance is to Jesus. Get this. Your allegiance is to his word. Before any other person or denomination or belief or country or country Jesus is first now listen there's a there there's a, a woman out there who is a reporter for Politico I don't know if you're familiar with that or not who said that there's a new group of people that are called Christian nationalist they are people who vote for Donald Trump as a Christian I vote for Jesus and I vote for any candidate that believes that abortion is murder right first and foremost and believes that God that he is not God and unfortunately, there's only one. Because the one on the other side doesn't believe that. So you can call me a Christian nationalist, but you better call me Christian first. Because that's what I'm about. So when we find theological error, we find immorality in the church, the Bible says we need to call it out. Not sit under it, not hide it under a bushel, but call it out and confront it. Number two, there's a word about sexual immorality. Somebody says, I can't believe he's talking about that. Well, it's in the Bible. It's not popular, but one preacher said, I never preached for a return engagement. Listen, if I have to be faithful to the word of God, then I'm going to be faithful to the word of God. And at some point in my ministry, I've decided to get over what people think about me and just preach what Jesus has to say. So one of the interesting things about the letter to the church at Pergamum and Thyatira is both of these churches had sexual immorality within them. And that is really prevalent in the book of Revelation. It comes up over and over and over again. It's also prevalent in our society today. You can't turn the TV on. You can't even watch kids' cartoons without it being in there. It's disgusting. If you go to, if you, if you go to Rome, you better go with, with binoculars on because there's statues and there are paintings, that, even in the Vatican with nudity in it. That ancient world was obsessed with sex. And our culture is obsessed with sex. Not normal sex either. It is perverted sex in many cases. And there was a day in our culture when Christianity had influence in our culture but that day is gone it seems like our culture is just bent running as, as, as fast and as far away from God as they can it seems like our culture is bent on destroying ourselves, and the problem is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm not just talking about Lighthouse Baptist Church of Hurricane I'm talking about the church of the world the church of, of Jesus all Christians everywhere have been more concerned about being accepted in the culture than they've been about demonstrating God's holiness. Than they are about demonstrating His glory and His purity to the world. I was reading the Pew Research survey that was conducted in 2020. And I pulled it back out this week to get these stats, it said that half of those identified as Christians say that casual, casual sex, defined in the survey as sex between consenting adults who are not in a committed romantic relationship, is sometimes or always acceptable. Six out of ten Catholics said it's okay. 
54% of mainline Protestant, 36% of evangelical Protestant said it's okay. Among those who are unaffiliated religiously, 84% said casual sex was sometimes or always acceptable, including 9 out of 10 atheists or agnostics. When it comes to sex between unmarried adults who are in a committed relationship, whether they're married or not, the gap between Christians and unaffiliated is less stark. A majority, a majority of Christians... 57% in this survey said that sex between unmarried adults in a committed relationship is sometimes or always acceptable. 67%, that's two out of three, Fred, of mainline Protestants, 64% of Catholics, And almost half, 46% of evangelical Protestants said it's acceptable. Listen to me. The culture has had more influence on the church than the church has on the culture. And those statistics ought to shock you. But unfortunately, it doesn't. And we're not left to wonder, what would Jesus say to the church in America today? He would look at us and say, listen, church in America, you're listening to that prophetess, Jezebel. You're allowing sexual immorality into your your church. You're allowing it into your life. And if you don't repent and get your act together, I'm going to bring judgment. I believe that America is where it's at today because the church has let Jesus down. And don't get me wrong, sexual sin is not the only sin in the church. There are a lot of sins that are out there. Pride, arrogance, gluttony. But sexual sin is the spirit of our age. And when churches compromise We rarely compromise on things like we should love one another. Nobody says that we shouldn't love one another. We all say, no, if we're going to compromise, we're going to compromise on a point where the culture is pressing in on us and demanding for us to just get along with each other, to just accept the way that everybody else lives. You young people need to determine right now that you are going to remain pure until your wedding day. And parents, you need to direct them that way. You need to help them to see that this culture is evil and it's geared to, towards robbing them of their faith or morality or teaching them to live like dogs. Because God is serious about sexual immorality. And we ought to be as well. Father, forgive us. And there's a third thing here. There's a word here about holiness. We don't hear about that anymore. The word holy in the Bible means to be set apart from sin and set apart to God. And the New Testament says, come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. In the Old Testament, I'm sorry, I said New Testament, Old Testament says that. Holiness describes the nature, the character of God. Peter said in 1 Peter 14, 16, he says, Be ye holy for... I am holy. He's talking about God. God is holy. He has called us to be a people that's set apart from the world. And the reason we don't talk about this very much is because Christians don't want to be different than the world. We don't want to stand up for truth. There's a movie out. The first part of it's really, really good. The last part of it's hard to watch. It's a war movie. It's called Hacksaw Ridge. And the guy that's the main character in there 
wanted to go to war without a gun. And so he petitioned to go to war without a gun. He was a medic, and he didn't want to take a gun. It was against his religion to, to fight and to, to kill, and so he didn't do that. And so he went into training camp, and they, training, and they, they found out that, that he didn't want to carry a gun. And so first the guys in the battalion with him that was train, he was training with started making fun of him. Because not only did he not want to have a gun, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't go around with girls that did, and he didn't play cards. He was just weird. And so they made fun of him. And they laughed at him, and they mocked him. And then they found out that he didn't want to fight. Bless you. And so they began to beat him up, and to persecute him, and torture him because he was different that's what happens in our society when a Christian says I'm not going to give in to the society first they'll mock you they'll make fun of you and then they'll ridicule you and then they'll begin saying nasty things about you and then it may even come to persecuting you and this man stayed and he was different because the world can't stand it when you're different the end of the story in that movie is when they all get shot up on top of the mountain guess who saved him he did he did god has called us friends to be holy he has called us to be in a relationship with him and that we are to be sensitive to the holy spirit so that when sin comes in our life that we confess it right away listen we all sin but we're in that close relationship with God that when we sin, we immediately confess it. We know He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to bring us back into the right relationship. We all sin. Amen? Don't tell me you don't sin because if you tell me that, you just sinned. But thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away all sins. If you're married, you understand this. Because sometimes when you're married, you disagree. Can I get a witness? Sometimes these minor disagreements, they kind of snowball. And then things are said, names are called, Pillows and blankets go to the couch. Those kinds of things happen. Amen? But you know that if you really love each other, what happens when you make up? You forgive each other. You come back into a right relationship. It's that way with God. Except he's always right. He's never wrong. We are, but he is always faithful to forgive us. And there's a final thing that I want you to see. Um, there's a word about holding fast to his word and to his works until he comes. Hebrews 10, 23 and 24 says this, um, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised it is faithful let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. In our spiritual life, we ought to be growing. There ought to be forward progress. We ought to be moving forward. Where you're more like Jesus today where you, than you were uh, a year ago. When, when you're growing in your faith and you're becoming stronger and you're, you're growing deeper and you're, you're beginning to reflect Jesus to the world than you were uh, last year or even five years ago. People are seeing you. And as you retain that next step, uh, let's call it in your spiritual pro pro pilgrim, the key is not to go backwards. The key is to go forward. So holding on means you've grown to a certain point. And you hold on to that and you don't give in and you don't give up. Even though the world's going to pressure you, sometimes the pressure will come from outside the church. Sometimes the pressure will come from inside the church. And so Paul says, when he's talking about spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, he says, having put on all the armor of God, having done all, stand.
stand and stand firm. Don't let the world and the enemy push you back. Stand firm in the truth. Because one day, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and Jesus will come again, and we will stand before him, knowing that he searches our hearts and our minds, which can be scary. But the wonder of his grace, the glory of his mercy, is that if we confess, he forgives. In fact, the Bible says he remembers our sins no more. They're cast as far as the east is from the west. I hope Jesus comes today. But if he doesn't, I hope we all stand firm in the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ. We cannot compromise. We cannot falter. We cannot listen to the lies of the heresies running around. We must stay in the word. We cannot compromise. Churches cannot compromise. Christians cannot compromise. Denominations cannot compromise. We cannot compromise the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to stand. And one day you'll stand before the Lord and what you want to hear him say is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Let he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Are you listening? Let's pray. Would you stand with me as we pray? praise team is going to come up I think and sing this song lead this song with us let's pray Father God in the quietness of this moment we are searching our hearts right now Lord we usually pray this prayer only at communion but Lord help us to look inside our heart to examine ourselves. first of all to see if I have a relationship with you if there's ever been a time when I placed my faith, my trust in you and you alone to save me because you are the only one who died for me. You paid for my sin on the cross of Calvary. And if you've never done that today, then why not in this quietness of this moment just tell him, God, I, I, I am a sinner. Just tell him that quietly. Uh, I need your son. Come into my heart and save me. Help me to live for you. Forgive me of my sin. I want to walk with you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I confess you as my Savior today. Lord, I, I, I also just pray for Christians today who have been dabbling in the world, messing around with sin that they shouldn't be messing with. Forgive us, Lord, for where we failed you. Help us now to live a holy and righteous life for you. In Jesus' name. The altar's open if you need to use it. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us And all who will believe Will sing the song of ages to the Lamb Your name is the highest Your name is the greatest Your name stands above them all All thrones and dominions all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy.
loving us. Thank you for this day of worship, and we continue to worship you throughout the day. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, all right, just a few announcements. Small groups tonight, five o'clock, ladies Bible study. Tomorrow night, uh, please sign up for 24 hours of prayer coming up this Thursday. Listen, this is the first, the first time, the next time you get to do this is four years from now on February 29th, right? Um, although we do that every month, but still, um, I want to news the dots and stripes nights coming up in March men's breakfast sign up that is this coming Saturday is that correct this Saturday at 8 30 sign up if you if you miss out a men's breakfast dudes let me tell you you're missing out what are we having this time omelets in a bag, in a bag. Ooh. momlet to go all right <laughs> movie night Family camps come and listen, we've, uh, we've had Fred's group kind of do a, a, a snacks, and then my group really poured it out for y'all. Um, the ladies group is in charge of this one, but there's only five of them. So if you're coming to the movie night, bring something to share, all right? Um, and not your appetite. Yes? You're doing barbecue. So something to go along with barbecue, which is just any snack. All right. Um, the buses are due back today. So if you have a good news bus or CEF bus, they're due back today. If you didn't bring it in today, shame on you. I, I'll be taking them down there probably Thursday when I go down because I got to go down and get my teeth work done. Uh, <laughs> which reminds me, be in prayer for little Leon, please. All right. Um, there's also this flyer in there. It's a serve tour. It's to go down to Logan County. And I understand you're from Logan. Yeah, and I understand you're from Logan. Is that correct? Brian, Brian, right? You're from Man, so that's close. Oh, okay, I thought somebody told me you were from Logan. But anyway, we're going down to Logan County to help clean up and beautify it. So uh, this is a Southern Baptist thing. It's not, a, uh, it's not a, our church thing. It's a Southern Baptist thing. So let me encourage you to sign up. I need to register us like last week. So sign up so that we can uh, be registered tomorrow um, that you're going to go. Um, it is a Friday and Saturday, so we'll go down on Friday, we'll carpool, go down on, on Friday, come back Friday night, go down on Saturday, come back Saturday afternoon, um, and, and so sign up. It'll be fun. It'll be a good time. Had by everyone. Uh, Tommy's going, so everyone else should go. Um, all right, I think that's about it, okay? Um, be in prayer for each other, um, and... Uh, Fred's got an appointment Monday with the oncologist, so be in prayer for him. 
And, um, and Bob's having some issues, so pray for poor Bob. Um, Bob has a lot of issues. <laughs> Not just health. But we love him anyway. All right, anybody else? Prayer request? 